Hello and welcome to another session of Neonates in a Nutshell. So today we'll be discussing respiratory distress syndrome and uh, respiratory distress within our neonates, so preterm infants and newborn infants as well. We'll be looking at what we mean by respiratory distress syndrome and then also briefly looking at some of the interventions that we can do in order to help these infants. For the purpose of this presentation, I'll refer to respiratory distress syndrome as RDS. Um, but let's have a look. So what do we mean by respiratory distress syndrome? So RDS, it occurs when a baby's lungs are not fully developed, which can cause breathing difficulties. So this is most common within our preterm infants due to the immaturity of their lungs and their underdeveloped lungs. However, it can also occur in full term infants as well. And it happens because the baby's lungs have not produced enough surfactant, which we'll look at in later slides of what we mean by this. Um, RDS it equals low lung compliance, can lead to CO2 retention and gas trapping. So surfactant, what is surfactant? So surfactant, it's made within the lungs, made within the body. It's a mixture of lipids, uh, carbohydrates and proteins produced in the lungs by the type 2 alveolar uh, epithelial cells. So basically you have your lungs, you have your alveolus, you then have your type 1 pneumocytes which help with gas exchange, you then have your type 2 pneumocytes which help with your surfactant production. So low surfactant within the lungs can lead to increased surface tension resulting in the collapse of alveoli and then um, the pressure is greater in the smaller alveolus because of the collapse and um, this is referred to as atelectasis. So basically in your alveolus you have a thin layer of surfactant and this separates the air from the water which decreases the surface tension and stops lungs from collapsing down. However obviously if people, if babies don't have enough surfactant or it's not adequate production then this is this is when you can um, you can get the the surface tension there. So just looking at these two pictures here, um, on the left in the blue, we've got your alveoli. So you've got a smaller alveoli and then a larger one. They have equal surface tension. They don't have any surfactant within them. However, the smaller one has is under a higher pressure due to the smaller radius. Therefore, it's more likely to collapse and be harder to inflate. So the best way to think of this is if you had a small balloon and then a larger balloon and you put the same amount of gas or air into both of them, the smaller balloon would be under a greater tension or um, greater pressure because of that. So then looking at on the right in the pink, so these are your alveoli with surfactant. So both of them have equal surfactant. However, the smaller one has less surface tension because it has more surfactant per area. They're under equal pressure, which is um, helped by the surfactant. And they will, the smaller one will increase at a faster rate than the second until it's kind of an equal size, just because it's got a lot of surfactant for its area. And this will help um, mean that you don't get that collapse of those smaller alveoli. So when babies don't have adequate surfactant, we'll maybe say that they've got surfactant deficiency and this results in um, decreased lung compliance so their lungs aren't working as well, unstable alveoli like in those pictures, increased work of breathing, atelectasis, which is uh, the collapse of the alveoli and then hypoxia due to that inadequate gas exchange and decreased functional residual capacity within the lungs. So risk factors for RDS, what are our risk factors? Which babies are more at risk of this? So like we were saying previously, your preterm infants, they are more likely to, to have RDS and um, this is due to the fact that they have less surfactant within their lungs. Preterm infants, so production of surfactant starts around 24 weeks of gestation. However, this is only when it starts. So this, this doesn't mean that um, they've got adequate support, uh, support of surfactant and it's not until quite a few weeks later until they actually have more 
more surfactant and kind of up to your term infants. So this isn't until even around 34 weeks, 35 weeks, you'll still maybe not be up to what a term infant would have. Um, male infants, they're more at risk of RDS. Babies um, who are born from a diabetic mother, whether it's just a, a gestational diabetes or um, she's had diabetes previously before this. So the way in which um, babies of a diabetic mother can be at risk of RDS is, um, so the mum is hyperglycemic, the baby then becomes hypoglycemic with, um, with in utero and the baby has lots of insulin, is produce, producing lots of insulin. Insulin inhibits the production of surfactant, so therefore when the baby's born, even if they're born at term, they won't have adequate surfactant there and they may then, as a consequence, um, have some of those, those problems um, such as respiratory distress and may require support. So other risk factors for RDS are your IUGR babies, um, babies born by C-section. <coughs> so your baby's born by C-section. Um, they haven't gone through the kind of normal stress of a vaginal delivery. So within a vaginal delivery, as they are, as they go through the vaginal canal, their skull is squeezed, which results in a stress response from the stress hormone, which is cortisol. And cortisol helps increase surfactant production. So babies born via, via vaginal delivery, um, this actually, it actually helps with their surfactant production. Babies born by C-section, they haven't gone through this process. They also haven't had the kind of squeezing out of the, of the fluid from the lungs. So this can also have a bit of an effect as well. So babies who are hyper, hypothermic, um, they, this will also inhibit um, surfactant production. Meconium aspiration babies, and again, because of the effect of the meconium on, on the surfactant, congenital pneumonia, and then severe hemolytic disease of the newborn. So when we talk about RDS, what are we looking out for within these babies? So we kind of looked at the risk factors. So you've got a preterm baby um, who's been brought around to the neonates unit. Maybe they're kind of 30 weeks old, um, 30 weeks gestation. And you might be thinking, okay, yes, they, you know, they're at risk of RDS. And then they start presenting uh, with tachypnea, increased oxygen requirement. They're working hard. They're assessing. Um, so you can think, and actually, yes, this does does look like an RDS picture. So that's your kind of clinical signs of a baby in front of you. However, we can also then get a chest X-ray to confirm this. And the things that we're looking for on chest X-ray is that kind of ground glass appearance, um, which may indicate kind of wet lungs um, or that RDS. So looking at the, um, the chest X-ray here, on the left we have um, a normal chest X-ray, normal lungs. So you have that kind of dark lung appearance, which is the air within the lungs. So that's that's normal. You want to see that those dark areas. On the right side is a baby with RDS. So they have a lighter lung appearance. This shows that there isn't kind of adequate air within those within those lung fields, um, and they're quite dense compared to the one on the left. So again, you can think in yet yeah, quite dense. There's lots of patchy areas. This is. Um, this goes hand in hand with the clinical picture of the baby um, and it's a bit more of a confirmation of RDS. So how can we treat these babies or support them? So first off, um, if you've got babies with low saturations because of, because of their respiratory problems, then providing them with supplementary oxygen will help. Um, and then also thinking about giving these babies surfactant. So you can give a man-made surfactant. We can um, give this as a medication into the lungs. Um, this is kind of in liquid form. This is uh, can be delivered via an endo endotracheal tube. So if a baby's already ventilated, then um, that can be delivered straight down um, into their lungs. Also via Ensure. So this is your in-out surfactant administration. 
So this is when you would put um, an ET tube in, deliver the surfactant and then remove the tube straight afterwards. There's also in kind of more, more recent years, um, which is in practice in certain neonatal units, not, not all as a common practice, is your less invasive um, surfactant administration. So this, we're kind of moving away from um, being too um, invasive and it's more minimally invasive. So um, these babies, they could still stay on their high flow or, or vapor firm device if they needed that, um, that respiratory support. A little tube is, is put down under direct um, view. A little tube goes down, you can deliver the surfactant into the lungs and then that is removed. Um, and there's hopefully less kind of trauma in terms of using this. Um, and it just, it just allows them to then just stay on their respiratory support that they were requiring. So what respiratory support is available? So we've said we can give oxygen if needed. Um, there's then vapor firm or your high flow devices. CPAPs, this is your continuous pressure. Um, and then BiPAP, Duopap, and then your intubation and ventilation. So respiratory support. So if a baby is breathing, then your non-invasive um, respiratory support strategies can help. This is when the applied pressure is greater than what occurs naturally. So it just helps um, increase that surface area within the lungs. So when we're looking at those um, babies with RDS, some of that alveoli will have collapsed down. By going on to vapor firm or high flow, this can just help increase that surface area again. You can also deliver oxygen in this, this same way with these methods. You then got your CPAP, which is your continuous positive airway pressure. So hopefully we've all seen CPAP, there's a little picture there. So you've got your prongs or your mask, and this is a maintenance of pressure during the expiratory phase. So it can recruit the alveoli, helps keep the alveoli open. So all those collapsed ones with that higher pressure, it's kind of like a sticking plaster. It just helps, um, helps increase that, increase that pressure again, increases the gas volume because those alveoli are now open and decreases the work of breathing, decreases the resistance within the lungs, um, which is what we were saying RDS is, is basically, um, is that resistance and that tension and then helps with the surfactant release. So some of the downsides of using CPAP, it's not always effective for CO2 clearance. And then also because there's quite high pressures, this can also just increase the risk of um, an IVH, so a uh, kind of ventricular hemorrhage um, with, within the brain. There's also risk of pneumothorax where there's that quite high pressure especially in your kind of um, bigger babies, more active babies, then, then this can, can be um, a downside to this. So then you've also got your BiPAP and Duopap. So these methods um, are useful for the failure to adequately carry out that gas exchange. So they're good to prevent intubation or kind of post extubation before moving down to your high flow or vapor firm um, devices. So they're bi-level, so two, two pressures. They have pressure on inspiratory and the expiratory. The inspiratory pressure um, supports the baby with taking a breath. And then your expiratory is kind of lower pressure that's applied during the expiration just to keep that alveoli open. So it kind of leaves a little bit of pressure and air within the lungs um, so the, the lungs aren't collapsing completely all the way down. So it allows for that PEEP to be applied. Um, this is really effective for the CO2 clearance as well. You then have your kind of high flow vapor firm devices which reduce the dead space in the upper airways, reduce the um, provides the fresh gas in that previous kind of dead space. Um, it's warmed, it's humidified air, which helps with the compliance of the lungs, helps with that expansion. 
um, decreases the work of breathing. It's not as harsh on, on kind of the face and the nose as your CPAP prongs and mask are. So there's, there's re a reduction in the nasal trauma. And then um, you can also, you have quite a good range within your flows as well. So you can kind of typically use three to eight litres. Um, so it can be weaned quite gently and um, it's quite effective for these babies. And then for babies that are really struggling, you know, they're really not coping with the, the gas exchange. They are maybe needing quite high levels of oxygen. Um, they're working really hard. They maybe have, have quite um, marked increased work of breathing. Then ventilation might be the strategy that's required for these ones. Um, and then also if you've put a baby on another respiratory device and it's not really improving things or um, they've had increased apneas or their gases aren't very good, then intubation and ventilation may be required at that point. So there's different modes and levels depending on the needs of the baby. Um, the thing with ventilation which, which can help with babies with RDS is the fact that you can take over the breathing for the babies or support their breathing. So um, can work with the babies, can, can give adequate pressures, you can kind of set the pressures, provide oxygen, um, and also provide a patent airway for these babies. The risk of ventilation is, um, is the risk of the barotrauma. So obviously you don't want to leave a baby on a ventilator for a long amount of time because um, we're kind of just manually um, making their lungs work and this can cause barotrauma um, and kind of chronic lung disease later on. So it's just working out the effective and the right respiratory support and respiratory strategy for the, the time for the baby um, and then moving them up or down in their respiratory support as and when that's required and keeping a close eye on them. So is the treatment working? So this is something that you're constantly assessing. Uh, is it decreasing their work of breathing? Is their oxygen requirement coming down? Is there an improvement in your blood gases? So um, is your pH improving? So it's less as acidotic. Uh, decrease in CO2. And then your decrease in if they're having apneas, bradycardias or desaturations. So if a baby is not improving or getting worse at any point, then escalation of respiratory support should be thought about and think about surfactant administration. So sometimes babies with RDS, they may require surfactant when they're first initially born. And it might be that they then require surfactant kind of a bit later on, whether that's a couple of hours later um, or a day later. Um, so they can sometimes need subsequent doses of that surfactant. So that's kind of just um, quite a small kind of brief overview of RDS, what it is, what we mean by surfactant deficiency, and then just briefly looking at those respiratory support modes um, and how they can work in different ways for RDS. We will go into ventilation strategies um, and respiratory support strategies more in depth um, in later neonates in a nutshell, but that's just, um, just more in terms of the RDS. So thank you so much for listening um, and hopefully you'll catch us next time. Thank you.